Pastor Peter will be taking us uh, back to the very beginning of Scripture tonight when he brings us the message from Genesis 1. So please now turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1, which, surprisingly enough, is on page 1 in the Church Bible. Genesis 1, and uh, we'll read through to verse 31. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And so it was. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit of seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days of the year. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing, with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and he said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit 
with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that he had, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. May God bless us with the understanding of his word as Peter now brings us the message. Thank you, Warren. So the uh, <clears throat> this, mo- uh, this evening we're just going to look at the first three verses of Genesis one. So I've got a, just a few comments about introduction uh, <clears throat> to our approach to this passage, and then we'll look closely at the first three verses of Genesis one. Uh, so tonight we're beginning a series, a preaching series uh, in the book of Genesis. And uh, uh, so we're beginning here in the beginning. Well, as we come to chapter 1, chapter 1 is certainly uh, uh, a different chapter from any other chapter in the book of Genesis. It's a chapter of the beginnings and it sets the scene really for all that follows. So what should be our approach to handling Genesis chapter 1? Who or what should set our agenda for our understanding of what is happening in this chapter of beginnings? Well, there's been two major approaches that uh, are currently in vogue, and and, uh, one of these is to give credence to the creation mythologies of the ancient Near East comparing and contrasting this account in Genesis with pagan myths and legends in order to come to an understanding of how the original readers would have understood these words. Well, we don't have to go that route because God did not accommodate his word to the mythologies of the day. Whatever the original readers understood or believed from the myths of ancient culture God intended them to hear in Genesis 1 the truth about what had happened in the beginning, truths that would dispel any pagan perversion of the truth of the matter. Uh, Do we have to interpret these verses in the light of the unbelieving science of our day? Does science set the agenda for us as to what we do with this chapter about beginnings? The Bible does contain answers to the questions we may have, but because there is no conflict between science and the Bible, we are not bound to reconcile one with the other. A third approach to this chapter is to allow the scriptures themselves to set the agenda for us. What does the rest of the Bible do with this chapter and with these opening verses? In opting for this third approach, the result will be edifying to our hearts and will speak decisively to the myths and legends and science and history and philosophy of our own day. Well, Moses wrote this account along with the first five books of the Old Testament. So the account of creation was not written at the time of creation. It was not written at the time God created the heavens and the earth. It was written sometime later by Moses. So it's not an eyewitness account. Nevertheless, it's an historical account where the history is provided by God, who was the only eyewitness of these events at the beginning. When we consider the life of Moses, we realize he could only have written these scriptures during the 30 years of wilderness wanderings between Egypt and the Promised Land. So the wilderness community was Moses' target audience. It was during that time that God spoke to Moses and revealed to him all that he eventually wrote down. 
and his target audience were the people of Israel recently delivered from 400 years of slavery. Under the strong and mighty hand of God, who had appeared in the land of Egypt suddenly, dramatically, without warning, by way of incredible signs, wonders, and miracles, much like he did in Genesis 1, 1 to 3. For 400 years, they'd only known the gods of Egypt. So you can imagine their questions as they left Egypt. Who is this God who has delivered us with such awesome powers? Who is this God who separated the water from the dry land so we could cross over? Who is this God who appeared to us at Mount Sinai in thunder and lightning and is now leading us through this desert by this blazing glory cloud, though we do seem to be wandering around in circles? Who is this God? What does this God want of us? Where is he leading us and is he going to stay with us? It was to answer such questions that Moses wrote this account. It was to answer such questions that Moses wrote this account. He wrote the account to answer the questions of their day. Who is this God who has rescued you from the land of Egypt? And Moses' answer was, He is the God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. So these beginning words will answer their questions, provide them with the assurances they need, provide them with a world view with which to answer the challenges of unbelief and give them a permanent record of God's saving acts. So looking now at those first three verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now there are two main ways to understand what these uh, first few verses are saying here in the book of Genesis. Two main, two main ways in which we uh, <clears throat> can understand the way these three verses are structured. The first way is to take these three verses as all part of day one of creation. The second way is to take day one of creation as beginning with verse three. Now the Hebrew vocab, words and grammar can be taken either way for these two options. So we must make our decision on the context given to us in chapter one and on the rest of the Bible on how to approach these opening verses. So let's take each of these two options in turn and look at them briefly. The first option, that verses 1 to 3 are all part of the first day of creation and should be read as one with the first five verses. Verse 5 ends, And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. That reference to the first day in our first option goes right back to verse 1, which means verse 1 and verse 2 are part of day 1 of creation. So in the beginning was day one, when God created the heavens and the earth. And by the heavens here is not meant the place where God dwells, but rather all they see when they look up above them. And uh, <clears throat> just to remind you of what it says in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. And in Exodus 31, verse 17. For six days, uh, uh, 31, 17. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. That seems to indicate that the first verse, God created the heavens and the earth, belongs in the six-day period. Well, leaving the heavens behind in verse 1, the account immediately focuses on, on the earth in verse 2. And so the rest of Scripture is taken up with the earth, the place where God's image bearers will inhabit and the place where God will work out his plan of redemption 
in Jesus Christ. So on to our first option. Verse 2 describes the state of things on earth on day one. <coughs> when God from out of nothing began to create. In the course of day one, there was the earth and darkness, and before day one was over, there was light. So God created the state we see in verse 2 on day one. On day one, he created the darkness and the light in the deep, which in verse 6 is called the water or the sea. And in uh, Isaiah 45, as uh, Isaiah reflects on these opening verses of the book of Genesis, in Isaiah 45 verse 7, I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. So the Lord created the darkness on day one. Now the second approach is to see day one of creation not beginning until verse 3. So verse 3, and God said, let there be light, was the beginning of day one under the second option. Now, under this approach, verse 1 is considered a summary statement, summary, summarizing what is about to follow, with a concluding statement to match the summary statement in chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. So you see we have a summary statement and a concluding statement. 1-1 one, one is a summary statement, 2-1 is a concluding statement, like bookends, really. And between those two statements, we have the creation week. Well, this approach leaves the question of what to do with verse 2. If verse 1 is a summary statement and verse 3 is the beginning of day 1 of creation, then where does 2 fit in? Where does verse 2 fit into the creation week? If verse 2 is not part of day 1, then it must describe a state that was in place before day 1. For many people, the advantage of this approach is that verse 2 provides us with a hole or a gap prior to day 1 in which we can locate the scientific evidence of an ancient earth. The Hebrew language in these verses will allow for either of these alternate readings. And there is much debate about which one of these two is to be preferred. Whatever position you take, there remains a third way to approach these verses. And that way is to look at how the scriptures as a whole treat Genesis 1, 1 to 3. So that's what I shall endeavor to do this evening. In the beginning there was darkness, water, Holy Spirit, and the voice of God bringing light. Now each one of those realities make up some significant redemptive themes that run throughout the Bible. So for these wilderness wanderers that Moses was writing, writing to, here is the God who created the darkness in the land of Egypt. Remember, darkness fell on the land of Egypt as one of the plagues, and here's the God who created darkness, and here is the God who brings the darkness to the land of Egypt in order to bring his people out into a land they can inhabit to God's glory. And God's voice was heard over the land of Egypt and at Mount Sinai. And what they heard was the same voice that brought into existence all that they see around them. The Spirit of God hovered over the darkness and the deep, waiting for God's voice to be heard. And when God spoke, the darkness retreated from the light. The darkness was not done away with. It was not dispelled. It was only constrained. The darkness was placed under creative constraint and given a name, night. So for all of us, as we read this account, at what any stage of history we live in, we understand from this that God held the darkness back so that life could be sustained, just as he held the water back so the dry land could appear and life could be sustained. Will the darkness ever return? Will the darkness ever return and again 
provide a threat to our existence. Throughout Scripture, there is constant reoccurring of the darkness. No more so than when Jesus died and a supernatural darkness over the whole earth came for three hours and the voice of God was not heard. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when God the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin and the spirit of God hovered over the darkness and over the water. When the Virgin Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit, she was told in Luke chapter 1, when the angel came to visit her, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Here's this hovering, this overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, a creative force which brings light into darkness. And as the Holy Spirit hovered over the darkness of Mary's womb, God spoke, and the light burst forth into our darkness. And when God spoke on the third day of Christ's burial, The darkness of the tomb gave way to light, and the light of the world burst forth in glory and life and hope. Thus you see these themes that we all see in verse 2 of Genesis 1 are treated redemptively in the scriptures. Again and again you see the scriptures go back to those themes in verse 2 of Genesis 1 and use them to proclaim the truth of God and light, and darkness, and creation, and new creation. So just picking up a little bit further on what the scriptures do with Genesis 1, 1 to 3. What what does the Apostle John do with Genesis 1, 1 to 3? When the Apostle John starts to tell his story of Jesus, how does he begin? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning. Imagine that, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word uh, was with God, and He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. You see, when Moses begins the story, in the beginning, God, light, darkness. When John begins the story, in the beginning, Jesus, light, darkness. You see what he's doing? He's going all the way back to Genesis 1-2, and he says, let me tell you the story of Jesus, beginning with Genesis 1-2. In the beginning, it was Jesus, and Jesus was the light. And he came to dispel our darkness so that we might have life. Where do you think John got the idea from to begin with Moses to tell the story of Jesus? Well, if you go back just one page to Luke 24, here's Jesus and his resurrection glory talking to the disciples. Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said and all the scriptures concerning himself. Beginning with Moses, how far back do you think Jesus would have gone? Beginning with Moses, do you think he would have gone all the way back to where Moses began? Well, you turn the page to John 1.1 and you find that John, beginning with Moses, doing exactly what Jesus had done. Perhaps that's where John got the idea from, of beginning with Moses in order to tell the story of Jesus. Kind of makes shivers go up and down your spine, doesn't it? What does the Apostle Peter do with Genesis 1, 1 to 3? Well, in 1 Peter 2, 9, 1 Peter 2, 9, 
but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In 1 Peter 2.10, Peter is quoting from the book of Isaiah. In 1 Peter 2.9, Peter is quoting from the book of Exodus. So as Peter talks about the story of our redemption, he goes back to Isaiah, then he goes back to Exodus, but then he goes back even further and picks up on that glorious theme of darkness and light that God, he says, has called you out of darkness. And what did God do in the first three verses of the Bible? Didn't he call into the darkness and call out something from out of that darkness that would produce light and life for all mankind? And Peter says, 1 Peter 2.9, that's what he has done with us. He has called us out of the darkness of unbelief into the light of Christ and the life for all men. What does the Apostle Paul do with Genesis 1, 1 to 3? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Paul is here is quoting from Genesis 1, 2 and 3. And his quote there is a little different from what you have it in your Old Testament because he's quoting from the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made between the two Testaments. So when Paul is wanting the Corinthians to understand the significance of the gospel and of their salvation, he goes all the way back to Genesis 1-2 and he quotes from Genesis 1-2 and he applies Genesis 1-2 and 3 to the gospel. Paul looks at Genesis 1-2 and 3 and he says to the Corinthians, there is an illustration and an anticipation and a teaching of how your conversion has taken place. <coughs> and the result is a new creation. If you just slip over to chapter 5 verse 17 of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It's Genesis 1, 1 to 3. God has called into the darkness and light has come. And from that light comes the creation of the world. God has called into the darkness. And out of that darkness, he has called forth a light. And that light is the life of a new creation, you and me. Created, recreated in the image of Christ. You see the picture that we're getting here is that Genesis 1, 1 to 3 is a picture of what God will do for us redemptively. We're understanding it in terms of its redemptive significance as the scriptures do. If you like, it's the apostolic hermeneutic. What kind of God is it that saves us from our sins? What kind of God was it that saved us from Egypt? Moses said, let me tell you. What kind of God is it that saves us from our sins? The apostles say, well, let us tell you. It was the God who causes light to shine in the darkness on day one of creation. And now does that same thing for us. The light we now enjoy in the life of Christ looks back to day one and looks forward in anticipation of a new creation of the heavens and the earth that is coming. So as the apostles have taken the light of the gospel and have gone back to Genesis 1, so now also before the scriptures are finished with us, they'll take the light of the gospel and they'll say this looks forward to a new creation of a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more darkness. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 23. 
The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. No night. The darkness is gone. The darkness that was held back in the first creation will be banished in the new creation. The darkness that was placed under creative restraint in the old creation will be forever done away with in the new creation. And our nail-pierced Saviour will himself be the light of that new creation. He will be the eternal light, just as he was the light on the first three days of the creation week before God placed a sun in our heavens. So every evening when darkness falls, we are reminded that the threat remains of curse and judgment and darkness. And only by God's saving care are we preserved during the hours of darkness from the forces of darkness. And when the dawn comes and the darkness is again rolled back by way of creative restraint, the morning light reminds us of the light of God's saving grace that shines into our hearts morning by morning. Each 24-hour cycle of the rising and setting of the sun takes us back again and again and again to Genesis 1, 1 to 3. And it takes us forward to provide for us a daily reminder in the heavens of the darkness of the sixth hour when Jesus Christ, God's Son, died for the sins of all those who turned to him by faith. So by taking a redemptive historical approach to these verses, we are able to do with these verses what the rest of Scripture does with them. To illustrate, anticipate, explain, and awe us as to God's redemptive purposes toward us. Who is this God who has rescued us from the darkness of sin and unbelief and brought us into the realm of light and life? It is none other than the God who created the heavens and the earth by the outgoing power of his spoken word. So when we read this creation account, we fall to our knees in praise and thanksgiving that such a God as this would speak into the darkness to save such a sinner as I. Praise God. Praise God for Genesis 1, 1 to 3. When we read this creation account, we fall to our knees in praise and thanksgiving that such a God as this would speak into the darkness to save such a sinner as I. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we do not need to be left in any doubt as to what you want us to do with these verses as, as we look in again and again through the pages of Scripture from the very beginning to the very end of your Bible. As again and again the writers of Scripture under your inspiration go back again and again to the very beginning to explain to us what you are doing and to where your redemptive plan is heading for a new creation of a new heavens and a new earth. Father, we thank you for the clarity that your scriptures give us. We thank you, Father, that they have that effect of, of uh, once again, uh, breaking our hearts over the magnificence of your love and of your gospel grace to us. And Father, we ask that as we reflect on the revelation of general revelation of creation with the sun and the darkness and the light and the darkness coming and going and coming and going. And, and remember that it's all because of what happened in Genesis 1, 1 to 3. And then to remember that this is anticipating a more, uh, something more glorious that is yet to come. Father, we ask that you would help us to bring every thought 
of creation under captivity to the feet of Jesus Christ. That we may see clearly what the gospel means for each one of us as we, as we bring the darkness of our hearts in humble dependence to you and ask that you would again shed your light on the dark corners of our heart and, and, and breathe into us again that wonderful life that you've promised us in Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen.